David, thanks so much for stopping by. I know a big day for the NRA, an important message. And there today at the press conference, the NRA really made clear that we need to do something right now to make our schools safer. We should put the politics aside and put the safety and the protection of our kids on the front burner right away. And I think that is something, you know, you talk to parents across this country with children and they say that's their big concern. Are our schools safe? That's right. You know, in the, in the days since the tragedy in Connecticut, people have been popping off. They've been talking about their pet solutions to whatever problem it is. Heck, the president has said that, uh, that what happened in Connecticut means that uh, the Republicans should agree to a tax increase, for Lord's sake. Uh, you know, Dianne Feinstein wants to bring back her old, uh, her old ban on, uh, on semi-automatic weapons, or what she calls assault weapons. The fact of the matter is that when you listen to all these things, and then you say at the end of the day, to Dianne Feinstein, for example, what if we pass that bill, which prospectively uh, makes it illegal to own, possess, or sell certain so-called assault rifles? How would that prevent the next school shooting? The answer is it wouldn't. If we engage in an overlong debate on how many cartridges you can put into a mm -hmm. magazine, how is that going to prevent the next school shooting? And the answer is it isn't. The public wants a serious discussion to answer that one question. How do we make it safe for me to drop my son or daughter off at a grade school in this country? And none of those discussions, and we can argue with them about these things, and we're happy to do that. As mm -hmm. you know, we've been doing and it for years. And there's time for that. There is a time for that, but that's not the question that people are demanding an answer to. And the fact is, we know what won't work. And in various places, it's been demonstrated that there are things that will work. You know, Wayne talked today about the one way to deter a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Mm -hmm. I just got back two days ago from Israel. In the 1970s in Israel, there were a whole batch of school shootings. Uh, they were shootings that were perpetrated by a different kind of crazy people than we have here. Uh, but the, the results were the same. And the Israelis decided that there was only one way to stop it, and that was to pro provide security in the schools. So today, retired military and others are trained in much the way that we train people, and they're provided to the local schools, and the schools in different ways handle it through their local budgets and the like. And every school in Israel has armed security, and that put an end to school shootings in that country. That works. Now, I hesitate to say this, but the fact is that the Israelis have a lot more experience in dealing with this kind of thing mm -hmm. than most of the people that are popping off in this country today. They know, as Wayne said, that the way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So when, we, when I got back here and we, we were talking and talking to our members, talking to our board members and talking to others, they said that what we needed to address today was that question, how do you protect the kids? And you protect the kids by providing security. There are a lot of ways to do that. You know, it's interesting because not only did the Israelis do it right, but during the Clinton administration, mm -hmm. uh, a program called Cops in the Schools was mm -hmm. passed. Didn't focus on school shootings, uh, but was nevertheless the infrastructure that could be used to provide this kind of security. And that program has never been funded as well as it should be. After all, we're spending billions and trillions on other kinds of things, and it's a question of priorities. We think the priority should be protecting the children. In Virginia, where you have a lot of schools that are protected, they're protected under that program. Mm -hmm. They get some federal money, they get some state money. And what, what we've suggested, and that's why we've appointed Asa Hutchinson, or asked Asa, uh, to be the leader on this. And for those, of, those that, are, that are watching us who don't know Asa, he's one of the most serious, thoughtful experts on this sort of thing in this country. This is a guy who was a U.S. attorney, uh, a congressman. He was the director of the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, and he was the number two man at the beginning in the Department of Homeland Security. And he, when Wayne talked to him, was thinking along exactly the same lines that we're thinking along. And that is that we need to be able to design and help and provide resources, and in 
terms of resources, I'm talking about people right. who understand the problem and who are able to deal with it. Today, we have thousands of retired law enforcement officers who are members of the NRA. We have thousands of people who are qualified. We have trainers. We provide training, as you well know. In addition to that, one of the big societal problems we have today is that thousands of trained people, veterans, are coming back from fighting our external enemies with the expertise needed for the kinds of personnel we need to protect our kids. And what we're trying to develop is a way to work with government, to work with local school systems, to work with administrators, and to bring these people into the conversation and answer that question of how do you protect the kids. When that's done, then we'll talk about these other things because these other things have to do with political grandstanding and not with protecting our children. It have to do with political agendas. And you know, as Asa, Asa Hutchison made clear today, there is no simple, single solution. But the big headline, you know, right away was NRA wants armed officers in every school. That's part of it. But as you said, it's also part, the important part is the volunteers stepping up to be part. People say, what can I do to help? This is what they can do that, to help. Let's, let's say, does it work? You know, Chicago, uh, the president's hometown and Rahm Emanuel's city, is one of the most anti-gun jurisdictions in the United States. And it's also a crime capital in the United States. Do you know that every public school in Chicago has armed security? Mm -hmm. Because they know. They know in Chicago gun laws don't work. that while maybe you and I shouldn't have guns, but that if they're going to protect the kids, they better have guns. It's no mistake that in many of these cases, the shooting incidents take place not in these city schools where they're frankly used to dealing with thugs. They take place in suburban or mm -hmm. country schools and small town schools that are unprotected. And that's where we need the protection. That's where we need the security. One size doesn't fit all. But in a lot of those places, maybe they don't want to hire a police officer. Maybe they don't want to use a permanent security guard. Maybe they've got in that small community five or six retired police officers or military veterans with the training and the expertise they need who are willing to step forward and provide that security. And there was a school just yesterday where a father uh, had volunteered to stand outside that school, a military soldier home from war standing outside. And he said, I'll stand here as long as I have to. But I, I also know, David, you have been involved in political battles and policy battles for years. But do any of them compare to what you're talking about here? And that is protecting our children, our loved ones. Actually, no, uh, because, uh, you know, as Wayne pointed out, we protect our banks, we protect our power plants, we protect private, you know, in this city, the less important the official is, the more security he's got, because it's a, an ego kind of thing. We protect everything except our kids. And then when we talk about protecting our kids, people say, well, that's ridiculous. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't, we shouldn't let them see people providing security. Well, if we don't, we put their lives in danger. The president often talks when he's talking about other programs about how our greatest resource is our children, and he's right about that. But why doesn't he want to protect them? Mm -hmm. Why does he want to expend his political capital going after the NRA and demonizing honest Americans while leaving our children vulnerable to the kinds of attack that took place in Connecticut? And Wayne and you called on Congress, help us get this done. They can't even get the budget done. Does that concern you, that, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that they're well, not going to be? Let's be clear about what Wayne was saying. Yes. Uh, right now, while we develop these plans, we need to protect our kids. And if, if cities, localities, school districts believe they need that assistance, the government should provide it right now. That's a short-term solution. The long-term solution is to design a program that brings in the American public, brings in gun owners, brings in the NRA, brings in retired police officers, retired veterans, to provide that security on an ongoing basis. And that's what we want to do. Uh, and I don't think that's an expensive federal bureaucracy. That's the wrong approach. Uh, but if it were, when we look at the trillions of dollars that we spend Absolutely. on all kinds of other things, I say take some of that money and pay to protect the kids. Mm -hmm reaction you've gotten so far? It's been very good. Mm -hmm. uh, 
our members are uh, very excited about it. We've gotten literally thousands of calls uh, at NRA headquarters, uh, particularly from our law enforcement division, from retired police officers, retired military, saying, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm here. I know how to use a firearm. I exercise judgment. Well, remember, some of these people are not just retired civilian police officers, but retired military police officers who know how to spot a wrongdoer, who know how to protect themselves and the people they're charged with protecting, and are ready to be deployed, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that there's any shortage of personnel. I don't think there's any shortage of trained personnel. Uh, and I don't think there's any shortage of people who'd be willing to undergo the training needed and spend the hours necessary to make sure that our children are protected. I think it really requires an effort to organize all of this mm -hmm. and to get the public involved and get all the school districts and those different places involved. And as Wayne said, they ought to be meeting and they ought to be asking, what do we need? And you've now given it's up them to them, plan. it's not up to, uh, we're not proposing that some, some, something be forced on them. We're not proposing uh, that uh, somebody in Virginia suggested that teachers be required to carry guns. We're not mm -hmm. proposing any of those things. What we are saying is that you need security at those schools and that each school should develop a plan and get the help it needs to implement that plan to protect the kids. And we put together this program this uh, National School Emergency Shield Response Program. I know I didn't say the name right, but it's, it's, it's somewhere <laughs> along those lines. And you've given them We have long names because we're in Washington. Yeah, but that's okay. It works <laughs> out all right. But that's something they can work with. That's exactly right. And you know, we've got people listening today, and some of them are, fall into the categories I've talked about that could actually participate in this. And others live in towns where there are schools that are not protected. Mm -hmm. And the first thing, that has to happen is that the school boards and the administrators in those towns have to know that the people they're there to serve want their kids protected. Absolutely. So you can start right there. 